Well, what I'd like to do is introduce Elaine Geyer from Collier County Museums. She's the curator of education there and works with all five of the free Collier County History Museums. She has a bachelor's degree in history and historic preservation and community planning and a few master's degrees, one in museum studies and another in nonprofit management. She's a Florida native, born in Fort Myers, and she loves sharing the Southwest Florida's rich history with both residents and visitors. So hello everyone, my name is Elena Geyer and I am the Curator of Education for Collier County Museums and I'm very excited to be talking to y'all today about the golden age of railroads in Collier County. It's a subject near and dear to my heart. My first job with Collier County Museums was actually at the Naples Depot Museum as their museum assistant. Um, so we'll, we'll begin. When you think about Naples today, uh, you think of a popular glittering Gulf Coast resort town, most likely with the car traffic to match. As, relati as um, relatively young as Naples is though, it has its roots as a small rural coastal village of 300 people, where boating was the preferred method for transportation um, because the few crushed shell roads that did exist um, made driving pretty much impossible. In 1927, though, this small village was changed almost instantly by the power of railroad technology that had impacted thousands of cities before that, um, when it became the end of the line for the Seaboard Airline Railroad's West Coast route. Today, you will be learning the history of the railroads who tried to conquer Southwest Florida long after terrains as harsh as the Rockies had already been tamed by railroad tracks. So we were way either ahead of the curve or way behind, depends on how you want to view it. So on that note, um, I do believe in the importance of establishing context on a national scale. It kind of puts everything into a broader perspective. Um, so if you will excuse me, there will be numbers in this part of the presentation. So apologies in advance, but let's see, next slide, if it will move. There it is. <laughs> so while much of the country was actively building and utilizing railroads for industrial, commercial, and traveling purposes, Florida's lack of just about everything except mosquitoes and a wide variety of water made survival of railroads rather difficult. According to um, historian Greg Turner, he's a prominent railroad historian, especially in terms of Florida history, of the 10 southern states, Florida had the fewest, the weakest, and the poorest railroads in, um, in the decade that followed the Civil War. Um, and you'll even see in this map from 1901, we're talking you know, 40 years after the Civil War, still very few railroads overall. Um, and of course, the railroad lines that did exist in Florida before that point were in the northern third you know, part of the state because that is where the majority of the population was located. So of course, using the term population is a bit of an overstatement. Um, I think it's important to mention populations because it's just, it provides, I call it a mind boggling example of why Florida's overall development um, just in the 20th century alone is absolutely astounding. Um, so I like to use examples of the two states that we share a border with, that being Alabama and Georgia. So in 1870, at the peak of reconstruction, Alabama had a population of 996,900 people. Um, Georgia, um, who, you know, of course, they had been brutalized by the Civil War with uh, Atlanta being burned down, essentially, right, by Sherman's March to the Sea. Um, their population was around 1.18 million. And then Florida, we only had, during re that Reconstruction period, about 187,000 people living here at the time. And, of course, they mostly just lived in that northern third part of the state. They weren't really down here. So comparing that with populations today, of course, Alabama has 4.9 million, Georgia has 10.62 million, and as of 2021, that post-COVID uh, mass move to Florida, Florida has 21.78 million people roughly living in the state now. So we went and ran with it in terms of population. So um, the severely lacking Florida railroad industry is really just exacerbated by when you compare it to the rest of the country in terms of what the populations were and what they ended up being, really. So, of course, you have, um, in terms of important railroad history dates, you have May 10th, 1869. That is when the final spike was placed on the first transcontinental railroad in Promontory Point, Utah. It was built between Iowa and California with 1,912 miles of continuous track. And then, of course, it was able to connect to the rest of the eastern part of the United States. 
So um, by 1871, there were 45,000 miles of track that had been laid in the United States total. Between 1871 and uh, 1900, there were 170,000 miles of track that were laid in the United States. And I will pop back to this map just so you get an idea once again. So we're at 1901 here with this map, and that is where we have 170,000 miles of track, still nowhere near Southwest Florida. And then during that reconstruction period between about 1865 and 1877, there were only 84 miles of new track that had been laid in the state of Florida. By 1880, you had about 518 miles of track. So we made some progress, but it wasn't until um, 1890 that you'll see suddenly 2,489 miles of track. And that sudden jump is due to the guy that everyone kind of seems to know the name of, and that's Henry Flagler. Um, so his development, uh, the, the development in the railroad tracks came about because he established the Florida East Coast Railroad, um, which was established in 1885. And he slowly began to work his way down the East Coast of Florida. Um, so we have a map here. You'll see on the uh, left here, this is a more, this was a more modern map. I believe this one's from the 1960s, if I recall, of, you know, all the stops that were along the Florida East Coast Railroad. So then, um, to, sorry. <laughs> so the Naples Improvement Company, this is where we start to get into Naples and how, um, and, and how it was really impacted by when the railroads finally did arrive. So the Naples Improvement Company, um, which of course, if you're familiar, if you've lived in Naples for a while, you know they're the ones who started to really develop Naples in the 1880s. Um, they had big plans for Naples. They wanted to create a winter resort on a relatively untouched piece of Florida coast. And their first objective was to build a small hotel. So you see that lovely little small hotel here, the Naples Hotel, some beach cottages and a 600 foot pier that um, would jut out into the water, into the Gulf of Mexico and bring, you know, people, bring uh, visitors, bring supplies, bring construction crews, all that fun stuff. Um, and then for a very long time after that 1887 start date, visitors to Naples could really only get here via one method, and that method was boat. One such boat was uh, the Bon Temps, for instance, which we have a model of over at our Naples Depot Museum. And it traversed the waters between Fort Myers and Naples um, from 1905 to 1915, and it brought visitors, mail, and supplies. And traveling by boat certainly has its charms. However, when the trip for an average winter visitor to Naples um, in those early years consisted of a train ride to Jacksonville, Orlando, or Bartow for, um, from, you know, wherever they were coming from in the Northeast, whether it was New York or usually it was New York, actually, those were the most direct routes. Um, and then, you know, you'd have to get to a connection to Punta Gorda, which was then the furthest South Depot on the West Coast, followed by a day-long boat ride to Naples, that charm can very easily be lost. So the appeal of this kind of trek only proved itself worth the effort um, to the most adventurous of tourists. So, and that's really who ended up coming here to Naples. They were these avid fishermen and sportsmen and, and sportswomen and fisherwomen as well. Um, you had a good mix of people who genuinely appreciated nature <laughs> that were coming down here to Naples. <laughs> Um, so then that limited access to the Naples on the Gulf um, quickly led to bankruptcy for the Naples Improvement Company. In 1890, only after a few years um, that their progress had begun, uh, the entire town was auctioned off to Walter N. Halderman, uh, who had owned a Louisville newspaper, and he actually bought it for about $50,000. So it continued, though, to be a popular destination for the more adventurous set of visitors. Um, many of them would end up coming year after year, so a lot of repeat visitors. But uh, the pier was still the only viable option, but you did also have, you know, for instance, some amphibious planes that were landing on Naples Beach. Um, or on Naples's first golf course, which was a nine-hole golf course a little further up um, a few blocks from the hotel. So <laughs> kind of fun to think about. But why did it take so long for the railroad companies to make their way to Naples? And once again, it all comes down to population and resources that were available to make that a possibility. So Southwest Florida's practically non-existent populations in the mid to late 1800s, such as when the Naples Improvement Company was trying to make this a winter resort, uh, made it difficult to justify that expensive building a railroad line for the relatively few who would ultimately venture to that region in that time period. So in 1920, um, Lee County, which also included what we know as Collier County today, um, had a little over 9,500 people. At that time, the residents of towns that would become Collier County later in 1923 made up just under 10% of that population. 
So this um, isolation after the first formal settlement of Naples persisted for almost 40 years, much to the chagrin of the businessmen of the region, and that included, of course, our county founder, Baron Collier. So in his efforts to uh, bring more industry to the area, he obtained a charter for the now, for at that time, sorry, defunct Fort Myers Southern Railroad, um, which they had tried to found themselves in 1918, and they got a charter to build south of Fort Myers, and it ended up not really happening. So um, Baron Collier bought it, and then Atlantic Coastline, who we'll talk about first, and you see this map here, they um, acquired it immediately after to begin advancing their tracks below Fort Myers, and they started this process around 1924-25. Um, so with the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, which was formally founded, just a little background on them, in 1900 and was based in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, they were they mostly operated lines through the south, so um, especially up to Richmond, Virginia area, and then um, down to Jacksonville, Florida. So in 1902, they actually made what many would consider to be quite the power move by acquiring the plant system of railroads that connected Charleston, South Carolina, and um, extended deep into the western parts of Florida. Um, I had the map up a little earlier. It was next to the Florida East Coast Railroad line um, that was owned by Henry Plant, who is the famous you know, founder of the beautiful hotels that were in Tampa, and now, of course, the Plant Museum, which is at the old uh, Tampa Hotel and the University of Tampa today. So building upon the base, oh, here we go, sorry, building upon the base of the plant system established, Atlantic Coastline was prepared to undergo further expansion into areas previously ignored by other railroad companies, especially in Southwest Florida, um, and where they started to build up their freight capacity specifically. Um, so they... Uh, they, they had Puna Gorda that was included in their uh, purchase back in 1904. They were the ones who expanded down to that area. Um, and then from that point on, that's when they start to break out into the rest of Southwest Florida. Um, so recognizing that there was plenty of freight business to take advantage of in the interior of the state, um, they began building depots inland. They connected a line to Immokalee in 1921 from LaBelle. Uh, many pictures from the era show that this station was incredibly active in transporting um, agricultural goods out of the station. So you see here, this is the station itself. Um, if you can see my cursor, I can never remember if you can see the cursor or not. Um, but if you, uh, the, this little building, little wooden structure next to the train depot was the train station. It was a very simple wooden structure, not as grandiose as the Naples Depot which we'll get to in a moment. Um, and then the photo at the bottom, that is on the other corner, that is uh, men loading watermelons actually onto a train. And you can see that it says Atlantic Coast Dispatch on the boxcar there. And then eventually ACL, um, which is what the shorthand for Atlantic Coastline, so I might use that interchangeably and I apologize. So ACL took over the narrow gauge rail that was actually owned by Deep Lake Citrus, which was owned by Baron Collier, you'll notice a trend, he owned everything, um, which was at one, I'm sorry, um, and they uh, had a narrow gauge rail that took people, that took uh, citrus, grapefruit citrus specifically, from an area that was right in between Immokalee and Everglades City, and they would take it down into Everglades City. It was very simple, uh, simply built, but then when Atlantic Coastline bought it from Baron Collier, they were able to build out the track, rebuild it, and then actually make it into a mixed passenger and freight service, and they also built a beautiful train station right in Everglades City as well, um, and that opened in 19, if I recall correctly, 1928. So um, this station now, it's still there. You can still see the building. It is unfortunately very run down. It was a restaurant at one point um, and efforts to save it have been a little difficult because of just how much work would need to be done. So definitely an ex a great preservation opportunity if anyone's interested. But um, so while technically though, um, the first train that came to Naples, and this is important because we'll talk about Seaboard Airline in a second. Um, the first train to come to Naples was an Atlantic Coastline train in 1926 because they had built a smaller freight, st freight station. We don't have any good pictures of it, actually, unfortunately. Um, they had built a station closer to Airport Pulling Road, um, near where the airport would be today. Um, and But it was purely a freight station. It wasn't meant to be a passenger station at all. Um, they were able to uh, uh, th they were able to have the first train arrive in 1926, but um, because it was just freight, it didn't have that same excitement, unfortunately. <laughs> 
But then you get Seaboard Airline, which was founded in 1900 in Virginia. So Seaboard Airline um, has nothing to do with air travel. I like to always establish that. It's the question I think I got the most when I worked at the depot. Um, this was established long before air travel existed, really. And um, the phrase airline was actually often used by railroad companies to kind of denote that it was the most direct form of travel, which is pretty interesting to think about. Um, so it was almost like um, it's kind of the equivalent term would be as the crow flies. So just very direct, straightforward. So um, railroads that adopted, oh, sorry, <laughs> following my notes a little too closely. One moment. So Seaboard Airline was barely behind Atlantic Coastline in its efforts to get to Florida, um, yet the railroad line took away much of the market share of Atlantic Coastline and Florida East Coast Railroad, resulting in Seaboard Airline being viewed as an interloper, if you will. So SAL did not care, and under the leadership of successful Baltimore businessman and banker Solomon Davies Warfield, the Seaboard Airline continued its ambitious pursuit of railroad expansion in the state of Florida. So I have this map. This is um, a 1950s map actually specifically, but um, it shows you where the Seaboard Airline route was, which is this farther railroad line on the map. Um, it's kind of closer to the coast, if you will, on the left. And then directly next to it is the Atlanta coastline line. So um, interestingly enough, when you look at the railroad tracks and what they would have looked like, and then even up into Lee County as well, uh, you see that they were pretty much almost parallel with each other. So they literally were neck and neck always. And then we have a photo that kind of gives you an idea of that as well. So the seaboard, sorry, the Atlantic Coastline Depot was actually down here near where the airport would be. And it had a line that extended out to Marco Island. So Marco Island did also have a, uh, a freight and passenger station as well, but that closed in the 1940s and it didn't really have a super long history as well. And then you see the Seaboard Airline Depot would be up here in this area. So Warfield's passion for getting trains through Florida paid off exceptionally well in the 1920s with revenues upwards of $60 million. His most ambitious project was the Seaboard All Florida Railroad, which would connect both coasts of the state by rail. Um, and then Warfield's greatest and last project in Southwest Florida was the Fort Myers to Naples extension. So Warfield was incredibly enthusiastic about Naples and promoting it as a most attractive place with beautiful beaches and one of the best situated winter resorts on the West Coast. Those are his words. Not only did he want to bring a passenger rail station to the town, actually, he also envisioned a deep water port at Naples. Um, and he really wanted the town of Naples to rival its popular eastern neighbor, Miami, which at that time still wasn't the major city it is today. So who knows? We could have, we could have been like Miami if his dreams came true. Um, but the Naples station was planned to be at the end of the line that commenced at Fort Ogden, also known as Hull, which was um, down through, sorry, down through Fort Myers, Estero, and then Bonita Springs before it would arrive in Naples. It was a 69 mile tap route, which is a term used to describe kind of an offshoot of another line. The land chosen for the station was considered at the time to be on the outskirts of the town. So keep that in mind when you see the pictures going forward. If you have any idea of where the Naples Depot is today, it sits at the corner of 10th and um, 10th Street and 5th Avenue, um, right next to Goodlit Frank, right between Goodlit Frank and 5th Avenue South. Uh, so it's kind of amazing to think that that was the outskirts of town. So it was surrounded by completely untouched pine flatwoods um, as well. So you see that in this photo here, for instance, this is actually the construction of the railroad as it was happening in December of 1926. Um, you see all of the trees around it and the railroad tracks themselves went down what is modern day Goodlit Frank. Um, they were on, if you're looking at Goodlit Frank, you know, looking north, you know, uh, it would have been on your left side of Goodlit Frank. So Keeping in mind Goodlit Frank today and what this was in this photo here of like, this is right before I got to the station. It's crazy to think about how much has changed. So then the architecture firm that was hired for the project had been uh, utilized by Seaboard Airline in previous, uh, sorry, railroad projects. So it was um, the firm Harvey Clark that was based, Harvey and Clark, that was based out of West Palm Beach. And Henry Stephen Harvey and L. Phillips Clark specialized in designing public buildings in the Mediterranean Revival style that was very popular throughout the southern part of Florida. Um, and so that's why Seaboard Airline used them a lot. They wanted to have their stations really match the location that they were really in, um, very much using vernacular styles. 
And uh, so it was also the reason for this is that it really served as a marketing tool more than anything. So um, if you were coming to Naples and you were arriving at this beautiful Mediterranean revival building, um, you would feel you, you would talk so positively about it because of its experience or um, you take photos with it to show your friends back home, which you'll see some photos throughout. Um, so it definitely was a, there was a reason for matching the look of the area they were in. So then the Naples Depot itself was probably designed by an architect named Gustav Maas, who had worked for Harvey and Clark at the time, and he actually would go on to become a very prominent architect in his own right. Um, he had designed many of the South Florida stations, including um, one of the stations that was an exact copy of ours, um, which is the Delray Beach uh, Railroad Station. It is unfortunately burned down. It burned down a couple years ago. Um, and uh, it's so we no longer have that around. But thankfully, our building is still there to serve as an example of what it would have looked like. But as beautiful as this building was planned out to be, it actually wasn't even ready for the grand opening celebration um, of this last stop of the west coast of Florida. So you see in this photo, this is January 7th, 1927. That's the Naples Depot right there. You can still see the concrete blocks. They haven't put up the plaster or stucco, I believe it was stucco, just kidding, um, around the, you know, the base yet of the concrete walls. So uh, pretty funny to, to see that, you know, really was not ready to go yet. Um, but the first train to Naples rolled into the station on January 7th, 1927, to fanfare that the small town of Naples was not at all used to. The Naples Depot's opening day was part of a larger opening tour, actually, of Seaboard's new Naples and Miami extensions, and Warfield arranged for a multi-day tour, picking up passengers from New York and Washington, um, beginning January 5th on five sections of his railroad's famous Orange Blossom Special. So that's the, actually the Orange Blossom Special in this photo here. And yes, that is the Orange Blossom Special, famous in the Johnny Cash song, um, although this is the steam engine version and the song, the, the train he sings about is the diesel engine replacement that came later. Um, but Warfield uh, called this trip the President's Special and dignitaries in Florida included his friend and biggest cheerleader, Florida Governor John Martin. Um, so in addition to Governor John Martin, the Orange Blossom passengers, sorry, Orange Blossom Special's passenger list um, included 600 invited guests, um, many of them being the nation's top businessmen, leaders, um, and shippers and investors, all kinds of bank, you know, bankers, everyone was basically included who had, who had money on this trip. Um, and they had been carefully selected from 90 cities in 18 states. Um, keep in mind, I did say 600 people. If you recall from earlier, I mentioned that Naples was a little village of 300 people. So there were actually more people who were on the train than there were people who lived in the town of Naples at the time, which is, I think, one of the most interesting facts about this whole day. <laughs> but so the first passenger train um, that came to Naples, the Orange Blossom Special, here's a close up of it back um, when it arrived at Naples. Uh, it eased into the station uh, around three o'clock in the afternoon on January 7th, 1927. Um, and we actually have a really great description of it from newspapers and also from the programs that they had of this opening day. So the following is actually is based on that. But uh, cheers went up from the clouds, sorry, the crowds. Flags were waved. The Czechoslovakian National Band of Sarasota, which had been furnished by John Ringling himself, and the Scotch Highlander Band from St. Petersburg played on the freight platform. Cameramen from the PATH News Service filmed the new arrivals, reminding, um, reminding people in the town to look pleasant, um, and captured the day's events on newsreels for screening later in movie houses all over America. Then a motorcade of hundreds of decorated cars chauffeured Warfield's guests to the Naples Hotel for a short welcoming address by Mayor E.C. Wilkinson and an elaborate buffet luncheon of hors d'oeuvres, caviar, anchovies, fresh strawberry shortcake, and orange ice cream was served. After posing for photographs in the hotel's gardens, the party then headed to the beach for some sunbathing or a quick swim in the Gulf. They also um, had the option to uh, go for a cruise on Naples Bay and the Gulf by motorboat. Governor Martin took that option himself. And um, this really was an overwhelmingly exciting day for the town of Naples. This was definitely one of the biggest things that has ever happened to them at that point. But um, in addition, and this is my other favorite little fact about the day, in addition to the building not being finished, uh, the Naples station had lacked a turntable, which is also known as um, a Y track, which is how uh, 
uh, trains are able to back up and around and be able to go back up trap tra oh, sorry tracks from where they came. Um, so they hadn't finished this process yet. So once all the passengers were actually back on board, um, all five sections of the Orange Blossom Special had to be backed up all the way to Fort Myers um, to be able to turn around at the Y track that was up there so that they can go and continue their celebration and head over to the East Coast. Um, so it's just amazing to think about a whole train literally moving backwards up a track for, you know, definitely at least 20 miles, 20, 30 miles. So pretty interesting to think about. So then the Naples Depot actually wouldn't be completed for a few more months, but once she was completed, she was a crown jewel in the small town of Naples. Um, her layout included both a white and black passenger waiting room, of course, which was an unfortunate norm for uh, the, from the time period. But interestingly enough, um, a lot of the reason for it was usually because Northern travelers also expected things to be segregated at the time. Um, the original Fort Myers Railroad Depot, for instance, that was built back in the 1904, 1910, um, somewhere in that early 1900s time period actually wasn't segregated, um, but then the new building they built in the 20s was segregated, which is interesting to think about. Um, but the Naples Depot was a combination station, which meant that it had both passenger and freight services. Um, so we are also often asked where the railroad tracks would have been located. Um, and thankfully we have the trains um, in our parking lot currently. So if you ever drive by and you're like, wait, that caboose, what's that silver car? What are they doing there? Not only are they for interpretive purposes about different rail cars, they also show where the railroad tracks would have actually been. So where the caboose and the green passenger, sorry, green baggage car are located, that is um, the uh, where passengers would have come in. And then where the silver train car is located is where uh, the the freight trains would have come into. So you can see in this photo here, that's where the freight train um, kind of the the loading dock, if you will, the loading platform would have been located. And then my favorite part of these of these two photos is if you look at them and then you think about all the buildings that are around them today, that's kind of crazy. It's a process. So, um, but then unfortunately, as impressive um, as the depot looked and as, oh gosh, as grandiose as the celebration was for its opening day, this excitement really wouldn't last because in 1928, when the Florida real estate boom went bust, so did Seaboard Airline. Um, and it actually, interestingly enough, was considered the first railroad casualty of the Great Depression. So our very own Seaboard Airline, that's a little sad, but um, with the company in receivership in 1930, the passenger train to Naples was reduced from a two a day to a one train, um, sorry, a two a day train to one train three days a week. Um, and so huge drop off there. And then by 1932, it actually was just limited to freight. Uh, only. So with all that effort, money, and hope put into the building of the Naples Depot um, by those who didn't live here, the depot's lack of use over the next two decades could be seen as a disappointment, um, but it could also be argued that um, though it gave the residents of Naples a little more time to continue to enjoy their small frontier town of Naples as they knew it, because very quickly after that, it would start to really start, you know, to develop. So with all, I'm um, sorry, um, despite the fact that S, um, SAL's finances um, would recover from uh, throughout the 1940s, they'd start to get back into a better financial position. The traffic on the little used Naples line was never um, really justifying the cost. And so in 1942, um, Seaboard Airline ended up selling the Naples Depot to the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, which was, of course, their main competitor. Um, they actually, uh, even though they acquired it, they ended up not really using the depot um, because they acquired it in 1942. A lot was happening at that time. We were now in World War II. Um, so they did not, they, they wanted the property so that they knew they had it, but they just let it kind of sit for a while. Um, so ultimately the railroad station was actually used as a USO um, uh, dance hall, if you will. It was used as a, as a socializing place for troops who were stationed um, at the Naples Army Airfield, which is the Naples airport today. So uh, it, it did serve somewhat of a purpose, but still it really was just kind of sitting empty for a very long time. But then this blue period finally ended 10 years after Atlantic Coastline purchased the station and in 1952 with the reopening of Atlantic Coastline Rail Service to the Naples Depot. Um, they also created a daily through sleeping car connection to New York during the winter season. So that means um, that you were able to take a train from New York and end up in Naples, Florida. Um, and usually it only took about a day and a half. It really didn't take long at all. Um, I mean, it was, or 
day and a half to almost two days, depending on, you know, what was going on with the tracks elsewhere, to be fair. Um, and then the particular train that came here to Naples was called the West Coast Champion. Um, the opening day was uh, just as exciting as the original opening day for the Naples Depot back in 1927. Um, and funny enough, the famous actress Gloria Swanson was actually on that first train, and she didn't realize it was the opening day, so she um, actually thought this whole celebration was for her, which is, uh, which is funny to me. So <laughs> very class classic uh, attitude of a starlet of that era, I would say. And so then from 1952 to 1971, the Naples Depot continued its passenger operations with an outgoing route um, in the morning and an incoming run in the evening and would typically consist of an engine, a sleeper car, and a coach car. Um, so these two cars would connect with additional cars at Lakeland, um, so up in the center of the state, and then uh, continue on to New York, actually. So uh, as you can see, it was only three cars, you know, three, you know, steam engine and two cars strong. So it really wasn't a huge train at all, but it was just enough to get people out of Naples or into Naples. So life for the Naples Depot would be relatively normal for a little under 20 years. Um, and one particular constant was Station Master, a Florida native by the name of O.L. Kit Carson. He was actually born in Immokalee in 1912. Um, and as a young boy, he would go and watch the freight and passenger trains that would go into Immokalee. Um, he'd actually um, go and try to help out at the station, and they actually let him learn how to do telegraph work. So his entire career was spent with the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, in, uh, which is amazingly impressive. Um, so back, he started at the Naples Depot um, in 1942. Um, even though it wasn't going to really be to use, he still was there to do a lot of maintenance for it and to maintain um, the whole building itself. And so then um, another figure that was in prominent part of the Atlantic coastline years at the depot was Cleveland Bass. So you can see um, in the photo, oh no, where is he? Oh, you know what? He's not in this photo. So Cleveland Bass, though, he was a very prominent part of the Atlantic coastline's history. Um, he served as a uh, as someone who would help with uh, like baggage, especially baggage or unloading and loading freight. Um, and so then he ultimately um, got his start with his moving business. So today, if you're in Naples and you see the van for um, or trucks for Cleveland Bass Movers, um, Cleveland Bass uh, is the founder of that business. It's one of the oldest black owned businesses in Naples today. And he um, was able to uh, he was able to start that business because a gentleman who was a regular user of the train of, of the Naples Depot um, because he was an interior designer, so he would get, get a lot of shipments, or he'd have to go out onto the train to visit clients. Um, he actually gave him five hundred dollars back in 1969 to buy his own truck so that he could actually start his own moving company. Um, and so it's kind of amazing to think that this whole family business here in Naples that's still going strong today started because of the Naples Depot Museum. So, and actually I believe they just celebrated their 51st anniversary, maybe they're on their 52nd anniversary now, so they've really been in business for a long time. Um, so then as for freight operations though on the Naples Depot, um, that is a very interesting one because we don't even though it wasn't that long ago, we don't even know a lot about it still. Um, we were able to get a little a, a little insight into what was being shipped out of here during those eras in like the 60s and 70s um, because a gentleman named Murray Fuel just so happened to walk into the Naples Depot one day um, because he was an old railroad man who had worked for Atlantic Coastline. Uh, he had specifically worked on fixing railroad tracks, so he wasn't attached to any station, but he would travel around to stations that would have railroad tracks being broken down. Um, and so he would come to, deep, to, the, to the depot regularly because apparently there was like a steam, uh, sorry, an, uh, an engine operator who would oftentimes derail right at the end of the line. And he would sometimes even go into apparently to Fifth Avenue slash 41, which is amazing, you know. So he would he would be down there quite a bit to fix those tracks. Um, and he remembers seeing anything from, you know, assorted produce. There were things like potatoes or tomatoes that were being shipped out of here. He remembers a lot of appliances being shipped out of the depot. Um, and that would make sense because today, of course, uh, the Naples Design District is a very, in, was it was especially in a very industrial area with a lot of businesses that, that specialized in construction or in, or in appliances even. Um, so he also candidly told us when this really cracked me up, he had made a comment that really the biggest exporter uh, for the train for the depot um, and out of Naples was um, was dead bodies. 
because people would pass away in Naples because they retired here and then they'd need to be transported back home. And that was a very easy way to do it. So a little dark humor for you, but you know, very accurate representation though of what life in Naples would have been like in the 60s and 70s when they were still doing some freight exporting. Um, so the 1960s brought continued use of the Naples Depot, although the numbers of passengers were dwindling by that point, um, as they were with stations around the country. So this wasn't just Naples, a Naples problem, this was, or a Southwest Florida problem, this was a national problem. Um, and the competition of commercial airline industry and the growth of the federal highway system meant that less people were opting for um, what they considered uh, to be better forms of transportation. You know, they had control over their cars or planes were way faster than trains even were. Um, you were really at the mercy of, you know, freight trains and, and, and timetables when you were taking a train. So um, people who wanted to get to places quicker or with their own autonomy weren't really using trains anymore because they had better options, if you will. Um, so to combat this increasing competition, on July 1st, 1967, arrivals became one with the merger of Seaboard Airline Railroad and Atlantic Coastline Railroad. And overnight, this new company actually became the eighth largest railroad in the United States with nearly 9,600 miles of track, 23,000 employees, 62,000 rail cars, and 1,000 locomotives. Um, in its first year of operation, the Seaboard Coastline actually reported revenues of $417.3 from both freight and passenger traffic. So things were kind of looking up for a second there, which is exciting. Um, but unfortunately, um, that really wouldn't last long. Um, so um, while Seaboard Coastline continued to operate passenger trains in Florida and actively promoted its New York to, um, to Florida service until 1970, um, things started to change nationally once again when U.S. Congress passed the Rail Passenger Service Act and created Amtrak in 1970. Um, so the Seaboard Coastline joined this new organization. Um, they paid an entry fee of $30 million and turned over its money losing passenger trains to Amtrak. So service to Southwest Florida, including Naples, Fort Myers, Venice, and Sarasota, uh, were not going to be included in Amtrak's new plan for um, rail routes around the country, and they were ultimately completely eliminated. So um, longtime railroad employees like O.L. Kit Carson, who at this point in 1970 was working actually at the Fort Myers Atlantic Coastline Station, um, and his replacement at the Naples Depot, uh, whose name was uh, N.T. Corky Alderman, uh, they were not surprised by this turn of events. He, um, Alderman uh, Corky, noted from his quarter century railroad experience that while there was some steady increase in the use of passenger trains, he attributed more to population growth um, than an actual need for trains. He said that, um, I don't think there ever was a great demand for the service, and there still isn't. There is a certain segment of the people who want the trains, but most are satisfied with other modes of travel. Um, that he didn't know of one any regular passenger, and that on some days we might sell five tickets and on other days none. So that quote is actually from an article that was written uh, in the Naples newspaper um, back when things were starting to, when they announced that they were going to be closing the station. Um, so as much as it's hard as we look back on it now and we think, oh my gosh, how great would it be to have these trains? Um, it really was just lacking in popularity. And, and even the men who were these lifelong railroaders, they knew it really wasn't going to be lasting much longer. So a final last train holiday tour was chartered by the Naples Holiday Times Magazine um, and the Collier County Historical Society, which is our kind of mother organization that founded us, although they're no longer the Collier County Historical Society, we're just the museums now. Um, so this event happened on April 21st, 1971 to commemorate the close of a 44 year long chapter in Naples' history. Um, 85 guests left the depot in two passenger cars at 7.45 a.m. for a day trip by rail to Lakeland and back via Bonita Springs, Estero, San Carlos Park, Puna Gorda, Fort Ogden, Arcadia, Wachula, Bowling Green, Fort Meade, and Bartow. It was a $12.50 ticket. Um, it also included a guided bus tour of downtown Lakeland and a uh, tour of the campus of Florida Southern College. So it was really a lovely kind of last hurrah for the Naples Depot for the train for passenger service out of that railroad. So then this is now the depot at the last leg of its life before it was saved thankfully by um, Southwest Heritage Inc, which was a nonprofit that helped save it by bought it 
um, put it on the National Register and then made it into a community center. Um, and then of course, ultimately it became the depot museum that's owned by Collier or leased by Collier County today actually from Southwest Heritage. Um, but the last official day for passenger service was on May 1st, 1971, and it brought the um, brunt end to this era, to the railroading era of Naples. Um, and then, of course, there would be some, there'd be some freight servicing throughout the 1970s, which is what this, this building kind of, this image kind of represents. Um, but by the late 70s and early 80s, all of the tracks that were on Goodlit Frank Road and all of the tracks that were all throughout Collier County, actually, including the tracks that went between Immokalee and Everglades City, they were all taken up um, and we no longer have any railroad tracks in Collier County. So if you're looking at a, an aerial map or if you're looking at a satellite map of Collier County and Lee County, you can see Lee County's train tracks and they literally stop at the Collier County border. So they are gone. But on that note, if anyone has any questions or if I could elaborate more on something, please let me know. And I really, I thank you for, for listening to me talk about trains. And hopefully you'll come visit us at the Naples Depot Museum if you want to learn more. Um, we are open Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. All five of our museums are free museums. Um, we have self-guided tours, so it's really just a lovely afternoon stroll if you're interested. So thank you. If you are enjoying watching this on YouTube, Please like and subscribe for more. Yes, and I don't know why I didn't put a picture in here. Um, yes, they did. So um, if you, you can't really see them now because there are no train tracks, but interestingly enough, it's where River Park is. Um, that, so that, that neighborhood, um, which was McDonald's quarters previously, um, you, if you notice that it's a, there's a weird curve to the road, if you go around River Park, that whole area, and um, that is where the train tracks were. So it literally centered around the whole neighborhood. Um, and so then, so they would go down the track, then they would go back up, they would back up onto the turn to the Y, and then they would go forward and back up the tracks. Yeah, was Henry Flagler involved in any way in Southwest Florida Railroad development? Nope. Not at all, actually. So he was only involved in East Coast Railroad uh, development. So, and he did go down, of course, he did the whole, you know, the railroad line to the Keys, that whole thing, which, you know, kind of starts to, I guess, technically cross over, but not really. So yeah, he had no involvement though. That's a good question. That's a question I get all the time too. <laughs> so. I guess he ignored us. He did, he did. I mean, that's, it really is a testament to how uh, the, just the population, the lack of it. That's why I really kind of emphasize that because we we have had such a huge population growth basically just in the last like 50 years, you know? Um, so it, it wasn't slow, it was sudden. Um, yeah, it, uh, the formal opening of the Tamiami Trail, like the connector between uh, the East and West Coast, that was in uh, 1928. Um, so that was, it was, you know, just a year later. So that also didn't help them as well, because now you finally have a paved road that you can take across the state. Um, so it really, it changed a lot of things. So, um, but yeah, so that was, that was 1928 though. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. I appreciate it.